We will be looking at forgiven and forgiving this morning and the, the text, the scripture we're looking at is Matthew 18 verses 21 to 35 if you want to follow it in the Bible. And it goes, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to, chew, uh, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had, that had, had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Amen. So it couldn't have been easy being one of the first disciples. One day you were holding down a steady job with a family and a roof over your head. The next, you were out on the open road following a man called Jesus. And one day you had a steady circle of friends and neighbours. The next, you were part of an extraordinary crowd of people which included everyone from tax collectors to former terrorists. And okay, while you didn't have problems being with Jesus, there surely must have been times when the other people around you rubbed you up the wrong way, or didn't share your point of view, or accidentally borrowed something that was yours. So it's little surprise then that after several months of travelling around and living cheek by jowl with strangers, Peter came up to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? I guess it's the kind of question we've all asked from time to time when our school friend or colleague fails to pay back the money we've lent them. Or our neighbour's dog does his business in your garden yet again. Or our nearest and dearest fails as usual to put his dirty socks in the washing machine. Knowing how far to forgive is a very real and very practical issue. And I don't think there's anyone who hasn't had to face up to this problem. And, by the way, let's not forget that among the extraordinary crowd of his first disciples, there was in fact also Peter's actual brother, Andrew. And I'm sure there must have been moments when the two rough, tough Galilean fishermen knocked sparks off each other. There are times, aren't there, when forgiving your actual brother or sister is harder to do than someone you don't know at all. So what then does Jesus say in reply to Peter's question about forgiveness? In verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. 
And just in case Peter was still unclear what he meant by this, Jesus goes on to tell a very simple but powerful story. Now this is nothing to do with the message, but I was, this week I was privy to a telephone conversation. The guy behind me is called Tom, and he phoned up Harry and asked where Dick was. And I actually virtually fell off my chair. The reason I mention this is I'm going to relate Jesus' story into a modern aspect. And I'm going to use three characters called Tom, Dick and Harry. There were once three children playing a game of Monopoly. Tom, Dick and Harry. And one of the players, Tom, was clearly winning and had managed to build hotels on the two most expensive properties, Park Lane and Mayfair. In the end, as always happens, one of the other players landed on Mayfair and couldn't pay the, the, the rent. But the first player was in a generous mood and didn't want the game to finish. So he said, that's okay, I know you can't pay me now, but when you've made some money out of your properties you own, you can pay me back. That's fair enough, said the second player. I can live with that. But the very next go, the third player, Harry, landed on the cheapest property on the board, which is owned by Dick. And although Harry only owed Dick a couple of pounds, he couldn't afford to pay him back. That's it, said Dick. You're out of the game. And of course, that's when the argument started. After all, if Tom had let Dick get away with landing on Mayfair, shouldn't Dick have let Harry get away with landing on Old Kent Road? Okay, Jesus didn't exactly tell the story like that, but the main point is the same. There is someone we all owe a huge, huge amount to. And it's not a player in a Monopoly game, or the people who give us credit cards, or even the government. We'll have a look at a short D uh, DVD. This is from I met The Life of Pi. If you ever seen this 12. film, I suggest you watch it. I met Christ in the mountains when I was 12. We were visiting relatives, tea growers in Munnar. It was our third day there. Ravi and I were terribly bored. Challenge. I give you two rupees. Run into that church and drink the holy water. You must be thirsty. Here, I brought you this. Why would a God do that? Why would he send his own son to suffer? For the sins of ordinary people? Because he loves us. God made himself approachable to us, human, so we could understand it. We can't understand God in all his perfection, but we can understand God's son and his suffering as we would a brother's. That made no sense. Sacrificing the innocent to atone for the sins of the guilty. What kind of love is that? But this son, I couldn't get him out of my head. If God is so perfect and we are not, why would he want to create all this? Why does he need us at all? All you have to know is that he loves us. God so loved this world that he gave his only son. The longer I listened this to the priest, to the more I came to like this son of God. It's a terrific film, and I suggest you watch it. 
So the one whom we owe everything to is God. He is the one that made us and who loves us. It is God who gives us the gift of life, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the love of our families, the joy of our friends, and so much more. And it's little wonder that in the official version of the story Jesus talks about the servant owing billions of pounds to his master, the debt we owe God is far, far greater than we often either realize or imagine. We owe God everything and we depend on him for all that we need and desire. And while this is a very basic and simple point, sadly it's something we all too easily forget. When we get out of bed in the morning, do we even remember to thank God for the gift of the new day? When we come home from work or school in the evening, do we praise God for the good things that have happened to us that day? I'm sure if something bad has happened, we're quick enough to complain. And I guess most of us have had a little moan about the rain. But when we feel the sunshine on our face, or the warmth of a smile, or the beauty of a sunset, is our reaction to thank and praise God, our Heavenly Father. That, you see, is what Jesus means when a little further on in Matthew's Gospel, he tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's about living a life where we are full of thanks and praise for the one who made us and who loves us. And unfortunately, it's something we're very, very bad at doing. And I wonder how God feels about our lack of gratitude. If we give someone a Christmas present or do them an act of kindness, we would hope that in some small way we might eventually get some thanks for what we have done. Of course there may be a chance that they simply forget and we can accept that. But when it keeps on happening time after time, it kind of hurts. So imagine then how God must feel when day after day we fail to recognize his goodness his love and his kindness. He surely has a right to be angry, doesn't he? But the amazing point of Jesus' story is just how willing our Heavenly Father is to forgive. So when the poor unfortunate servant falls on his knees and begs for mercy, it is mercy that he receives. And I think that before we rush on and get to the end of the story, it's worth stopping for a moment and thinking about this whole issue of mercy. Because I reckon most of us are very comfortable with the idea that God loves us, and we find it very comforting to think of him as our Heavenly Father. But if we're honest, we don't tend to understand we are in need of God's mercy. Yet that is exactly the position all of us are in. We need God's mercy the times we live as if he isn't there, when we fail to give him thanks for the good things he gives us, when we think everything we have is a result of our own efforts and our own goodness. So how exactly do we find God's mercy? Well, this is where our first reading, sorry, from the reading from Romans comes in, more specifically chapter 5 verse 8, in which Paul tells us that God demonstrates his own life for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And Christ's death on the cross, you see, was not the accidental death of a martyr, or merely an example for us to follow. It was Jesus bearing the consequences of all our lack of gratitude to God. All the selfishness, and pride that comes from trying to live our way and not God's. His death was the way in which our sins, our debt towards God was cancelled, our relationship with him restored. So when we ask 
our fellow brothers and sisters? Do you turn to Christ as your Lord and Saviour? You're being asked whether you accept this is what Jesus has done for you. And when you're asked, do you repent of your sins? You're being asked whether you are ready to live a new kind of life where God is at the centre. Where you give him the thanks and praise that is probably his due. And these questions are questions which all of us need to think about if we want to have a new life with God and to have our sins forgiven. Now I guess in many ways it would be easy to finish the message at this point and leave you to answer this question for yourselves. And in a little while this is precisely what I'm going to do because it is such an important question. But I realise that in terms of this morning's readings we have only reached halfway through Jesus' story and we still haven't properly dealt with Peter's question. How many times shall I forgive my brother? But I hope you can at least start to see that when Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times, he wasn't intending us to start counting until the other person has committed offence number 78. What Jesus really means is that when somebody else has wronged you, you ought to keep on forgiving more than you think is reasonable. Because that is precisely how much God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven us. And the acid test of whether we really have understood what it means to turn to Christ and to find God's mercy lies not in saying the right words on a Sunday morning, but in fact things we say and do on a Monday morning. The way we react when somebody cuts us up on the way to work. When the person we let a fiver to on a Friday doesn't repay. When our nearest and dearest leaves their dirty socks in a pile yet again. I think the simple truth is we are more like the servant in this story than we care to realise. I certainly know I am. We leave church maybe with a fresh sense of God's presence with us and as soon as we get back home we get cross, angry, irritable with the first person that upsets us. And that's why following Jesus involves not only accepting his forgiveness but letting his Holy Spirit change us from the inside filling us with his love, his patience, his goodness and changing our relationships with one another. Not that this business of forgiving one another is easy. Forgiveness sometimes can be hard. And if we need any evidence of that, we need only to look at the cross. That's how much God had to give to show us his mercy. His only son, Jesus Christ. Nor must we imagine that forgiveness is somehow just brushing everything under the carpet, as if nothing really happened. In the few verses before this story, Jesus quite clearly tells his followers, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. So again, true forgiveness is about being open and honest about the hurt that has been caused, in the same way that the cross shows us openly and honestly the amount of hurt caused to God by our failure to thank him as we ought. But if we can get this difficult business of forgiveness sorted, if we are open to being forgiven by Jesus and to forgiving others, then all the evidence suggests we will see a real change, not only in our own lives, but also in the lives of those around us. And at the end of this message, we'll be saying the Lord's Prayer and we will pray your kingdom come your will be done now I don't know if you've ever thought what those words mean or how God's kingdom will come or his will be done but I suggest that the answer comes a few lines further on when we pray forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us 
Do you see the connection? I expect that many of us this morning have prayed these words hundreds, if not thousands of times before. But we probably don't even think that much about what we are saying. But I want to challenge you and say, these words are at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian. To be a Christian involves firstly recognizing the way we have not given thanks to God for his goodness, and so turning to Jesus in faith and trust for his mercy. That's what we mean by forgive us our sins. But secondly, it's also all about responding to Jesus' love for us by sharing that love with others, by willing to forgive as Christ forgave us. That's why the prayer goes on to say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And if we're up to the challenge and prepared to take Jesus at his word, then I believe that we will have good news to share in the world of unforgiveness, loneliness and fear, and that God's kingdom will come and his will shall be done here and everywhere. So the question I leave is this. Do you know the forgiveness that comes from believing in Jesus Christ? And if so, what practical difference does that forgiveness make in your life? Let's pray. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.